Part of the 2020 Hall of Fame class, NBA champ Kevin Garnett just released a new book a couple of months ago, KG A to Z, an uncensored encyclopedia of life, basketball, and everything in between. And as a Showtime documentary, Anything is Possible, that'll be released next month. Doing big things there, KG joining us. When's the last time you played pickup? Last time I played pickup, oh my God, uh, probably three years ago, two years ago, when I used to train guys. When I used to train guys, I was probably around the game a lot more and um, used to jump in a couple, you know, 21s and some three on threes and some fives on fives, just, 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 you know, just for a couple games. Could you yeah, play it all? Years. Could you play it all now? Yeah. Yeah. I can play. I can play for probably about 10 to 12 minutes if I had to in a real NBA game. The way the pace is now, because when you're younger, Dan, you're, you, I'm chasing every rebound and, you know, I'm attempting to try to get all those rebounds. You don't get them all. <laughs> when you get older, you, you're, you use energy smarter, you know, like I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't attempt to go for every offensive rebound. I wouldn't, I would start, I would, I would sprint a uh, three, three point line, a three point line and be, you know, be good. There's ways that you can cut like corners if you will, when you get older to, to not exhaust yourself. But yeah, if I had to, I feel like I could. How uh, were you surprised that Anthony Davis played last night? He was cleared to play last night. I was, I was, I was shocked actually. Yeah. I, I was actually shocked that he made the trip. I was shocked that he was standing up on the sideline. I know I've had uh, a growing injury before anybody that's had a growing injury. It is the worst or one of the worst injuries you can have that you, you're very, very, um, limited to what you can do uh, and being mobile. Um, the one thing you can't do, you can't laterally do anything. You can't, you can't even, you can't get in the lateral stance. So I was very shocked that he was on the floor and that he had got cleared. I felt the same way because as soon as he stepped 60 seconds in, I go, he can't play. And I wonder if Charles Barkley giving him that nickname of street clothes played a role in him just saying, I want to get. I want to get in the game. I want to have my uniform on. I don't want to be sitting here in street clothes. Am I reading too much into that? First off, if if that was the case and you cared about any of this, then I felt like he would have came out with a better lather. You would have known in warmups if he could have been able to go or not. That's one. Then two, I don't think the young fella is actually. I think he hears it. Yeah. You know, but this is all about doing something for yourself. He has to take another level of improving his body. Let's just keep this real. LeBron came to L.A. to not just, you know, you know, leave out the league on a great note with a, you know, a great uh, establishment like the Lakers. But he wanted to play with a younger version of someone that he can actually like similar to what D-Wade did to him in Miami. Yo. He, he came to A.D.'s in, 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 in L.A. to continue the, the, the legacy, to continue the championship legacy, to, to continue the spirit. And right now he's not doing that. He has to go to another level with his body and his training. Whatever he's been doing the last 10 years is not working. He should not be out of shape during the regular season. I don't understand that one. Did you talk trash to LeBron? I talked trash to where I saw an advantage. You understand? And let me let me let me get something clear out here. Dan, I have never ever in my life disrespected a man or his family or his wife or his mom or none of that. I have never in my life. Now I talk about how I'm busting your ass out here. I talk some trash about how, you know, I'm getting this turnaround off, how you can't stop this. How I used to love to call guys moves out before they do it. <laughs> anywhere I saw advantage or anywhere I saw weakness, I would actually attack that. That's what Carl Malone did to us as young boys. That's what Charles Barkley did. The greatest, the greatest ever talk it and back it up. It comes with something, too, though. A lot of people don't understand. Talking trash comes with something. But I would never in my life. I always kept it basketball. We as basketball players know to keep it basketball. We know that crossing the line crosses the line. And I've never crossed the line. But, yeah, I've talked trash to LeBron, and LeBron has talked trash back. <laughs> Chris, Bosch, game. Chris Bosch was with us two days ago, and he said he stopped talking trash with you because it took him out of his game. Talking trash is a mental, is, is a mental game. You know, getting someone to, first off, you have to have the energy to be able to talk. And then you have to have your information. 
You know, talking trash is about breaking someone down mentally and getting them to do and multitask when most people most people can't multitask. Most people can't do two or three things at once. And to be able to master that is, is something, something different. I watched Gary Payton. I watched Charles Barkley control games. I watched them control the refs. I watched them control momentum. And when I saw that, I saw that that can be done. I, then the referees and the game started getting better. But for the most part, man, the competition – it's about both a physical and mental state. And if you can't be in both of those, then you're exposed. But, you know, um, I respect everybody and who I play. Every, every, I was getting everybody's best and felt like everybody that was in the league was getting my best. So I, I've never played a guy where it was just an easy night. You know what I'm saying? You don't get easy nights in the league. That doesn't exist in professional sports. We're talking to Kevin Garnett. He's uh, got a book out. It's KGA to Z, an uncensored encyclopedia of life, basketball, and everything in between. And uh, Showtime documentary, Anything is Possible, released next month. Uh, What's in the book that might surprise people? Because you say it's uncensored. Where did you get real? Where did I get real? Like, you know, there's things that you say, and then there's things like somebody's going to go, oh, wow. Like, is there an oh, wow moment or chapter topic that you have in the book? I don't know. I just think sometimes that I would look up and some of the was like a movie to me, Dan. Like, I would be looking up and I'd be like, this is something straight out of, you would see this in like theater or something, right? Um, the connection with the with all the Celtics in 08, um, uh, you know, how my mom raised, how, how she raised me and my two sisters. I wouldn't say it would be wow. And the reason I think I wrote the book was because uh, to show the normalcy and the human side of me uh, and the things that, you know, I was able to uh, beat or uh, be able to find solutions to. I wanted to cre- create solutions for people who was lost or went through similar situations and, and was trying to relate and wanted to be able to find some some common solutions to the to the problem. So, you know, I, I get a lot of DMs. I get a lot of um personal mail about people and how they how, how to survive and during rough times and sharing stories um Avita Sabonis I think a lot of people were shocked that I actually <laughs> knew who Avita Sabonis was and that he was a huge play into my development and just creatively and imagine and, and as an imagination to have an imagination of being that big and being creative and being mobile like he was I don't think people were shocked I think people, a lot of people were shocked that I actually knew his history. Yeah. Don Stanley being, uh, um, Don Stanley being one of my idols growing up, even though she was a female, I loved her style. Her and Keenan Anderson was my all time favorite guards. I took the rubber band uh, idea from her. It, t- <laughs> it kept me very disciplined <laughs> times where, I, you know, like, I don't know, man. I, I don't know. It's, it's like for whoever, whoever's reading it and for whatever reasons they're reading it, looking for whatever they're looking for. Um, I found I found a lot of people found some solutions in the book, which is the biggest compliment to me, at least. You come out of high school right to the pros. What kind of offers did you get to go to college? You don't have to give me names of schools, but what 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 were you offered to go to college? I won't embarrass anybody. Or I won't put it out there, no shit like that. But um, I got offered a lot a lot of a lot of cash my mother and my, um, and my family to have better opportunities um, to meet some of the most powerful people in the world, whatever that meant. <laughs> and um, I think I told the story in the book where it was a situation where I was staring at my grandmother at the time because recruiting was getting to the point where it was just obese and, I, and my mother thought it'd be perfect or a better idea for me to change addresses. And uh, life was running so fast at this time, but I had a certain recruiter come see me and he offered me some cash in front of my grandma. And she went and got a shotgun and told me to always set the tone with people that you can never be bought. And if you be if you can be bought once, you can be bought always. And, I, and that stuck with me forever, forever. Wait, wait, what did the recruiter do when grandma gets a shotgun? I had to tell him he had to get his bag and get the hell up out of here or him and his bag weren't going to make it out of here. <laughs> and I thanked him for coming through. I told him I love this school, but this this wasn't going to work like this. And he, he wanted to talk. And I think the quicker she put the shotgun together, the quicker we ended the conversation. <laughs> but yeah, that, that guy's still around. Whenever I see him, I like to wink and be like, how you doing? He's like, man, said, yeah. So that's just between him, myself, and God and my grandmother. Uh-huh. Rest in peace to my mom. No, yeah. Oh, my grandma milk. Grandma's packing. Man, in the South, they are. I definitely know that. <laughs> Ain't no games. Ain't no games. 
Were you were you concerned though with living in Chicago? I, you know, you know, it was only one year, but just what Chicago was like back then. What was the question? What'd you say? What What was it like? You know, you go from South Carolina to Chicago. What was it like? Were you ever concerned about just when you're not on a basketball court? Everything that. Oh, you're concerned. You're concerned every day. Um, um, Chicago was like a download to how to survive life. Like I'm, I'm like I grew up in like a little rough neighborhood, and you know it's hood, it's streets, whatever. But Chicago, big city, L.A., New York, Houston, uh, Miami, the bigger cities. They come with a lot more uh, structure. They come up. They come up with a lot more, a um, lot less development in neighborhoods. It's not a lot, you know. So you understand uh, places like youth centers. You understand the boys and girls club. That's kind of universal. So when I got to Chicago, you, I had to understand how the lay of the land works. You know, Chicago is full of gangs. It's full of structure. You know, over here is this. Over there is this. Um, the police there is very different. They speak and deal with you very different in the big cities. So I had to get a download of all that. Every day in Chicago, your head on swivel. Your head on swivel means you're looking left and right. And if not, you're in, you're in something before you know it. And Chicago taught me, and I felt like Chicago built me so that I was able to go to the league, both physical and mentally. You know, I was playing against guys that's in the street. It's probably better than some guys that's in the NBA and came up short. Or had kids or, you know, got addicted to drugs and, and, and vices and just didn't make it. And um, I would encounter a lot of those didn't make it. And I, I encountered a bunch of different talent in Chicago that I felt like, man, not just living here is hard, but man, these guys can actually play the game. Yeah. And it definitely sharpened me and it definitely got me ready for the league. And I felt prepared. I felt like it couldn't be nothing worse than living or going through what I have to go through every day on these streets in the go, you know, straight up and down, like trying to survive in the big city is a real thing. What was the best part of your experience working with Adam Sandler on the movie Uncut Gems? Seeing Adam's MJ-ness, his goatness. You know, it's times where I couldn't tell, I, I couldn't, it was at times where Howard, was Adam and I didn't really understand I really didn't understand like embracing the character and he would be in this character he would stay there and he would stay there he would be Howard and and he would be talking to us and dealing with us as if he was Howard and I had never experienced nothing like that I had never experienced someone be great in their in, in their craft and in, in, in this craft and acting and it would it would be times where um in this dialogue we had a dialogue in his office going back and forth and he, he, he was he was just playing with the dialogue and he was throwing it and I was catching it. But I was like, holy snap, this is this this is this is greatness. I'm in it. I'm in it. I am in the dialogue of greatness right here. And I understand this connection like I, I totally got acting at that point. But the, the dope part of seeing someone in their greatness and seeing how that you can learn and soak up so much stuff. It, it was it was one of the best and greatest experience I've ever had in life, like to see, to, 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 to try to do something that you, you know, you know, you're not as good in and then learn from it. And then it felt like I grew from that. Being around Adam every day makes you better. If that makes sense. Yeah. He's been Great a experience. Yeah. I've, I've been around him a long time, been in, I think now 20 of his movies. So, uh, I, 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 I know, I know, you're you're, I know, I know what you're talking about. Uh, let me <laughs> leave you with this KG. Cause I, I still am baffled with what your Celtics are doing. So you mm. you have a great coach who goes into the front office who now has to hire a coach. I got I, I how about you just hire a really great GM and then keep Brad Stevens as a coach? Help me understand well, this. So I'm gonna take this, and this is my theory in this. I have no equity, nothing in the Celtics other than my heart, my and what I've what I've paid dues to. I'm always a C at heart. This is how this is my theory on this though. So Brad Stevens came in and built this system and this, I guess this, um, I don't want to say pedigree, but he built, he built a structure there that the guys have believed in. I feel like when you do that, the investment is there. You know, Danny has been whispering and has been hinting at, you know, leaving it. He and Brad have a great, uh, not just a working relationship, but have a, a great communication and 
a great transparency about them. And I think Danny feels that if he was going to step away, if it couldn't be his son, Austin, or if it couldn't be numbers, who is like Danny's assistant GM, um, then it probably would be Brad. They, they, they put the investment there. The time has been there spent. They've gotten these players. They've gotten these players to believe in the, in, in, in the ideal of, of the structure. Now it's about putting players and building players and bringing players and building that structure. So I, I, I'm, I'm just like you. I'm baffled. Um, I've never known uh, Brad to be able to uh, be in charge of operations or any of that. He hasn't witnessed, witnessed. We haven't witnessed none of that yet. So let's see. Let's find out. I mean, he's part of the family. I can see him wanting to keep things in family. Um, but this is all Danny Ainge and him thinking and thinking that Brad can do this. And uh, it, it just remains to be seen. I'm as, just as baffled as you, though. Great to talk to you, KG. Uh, good luck with the book. Good luck with the uh, Showtime documentary that's released uh, next month. Great to talk to you again. Always good to see you, Dan, man. Always a huge fan of you and the show, and I appreciate you having me, man. Thank you, Kevin. That's uh, Kevin Garnett, Hall of Famer. We'll take a break.